Wedding season is getting underway. The flowers are blooming. The sun is shining. Canadians, uh, many of us will be heading to the altar this summer, not me. But in all the excitement, our guest says um, it can be easy to put off tough conversations that are essential, such as signing a prenuptial. Why could a pre not be right for you? Uh, how should you go about planning finances for marriage? We're joined by divorce lawyer Ron Shulman, founder and managing partner at Shulman & Partners. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Yes, thank you for having me. Do you think most people, maybe all people, should have some kind of a prenuptial agreement? Well, I think that's a great question. And uh, I, I think it's important to remember that, and I know I'm not gonna sound very romantic here, that a marriage, a decision to marry is essentially a transaction and it creates legal rights and obligations. And what a marriage agreement does fundamentally is creates predictability in respect to those rights and obligations. Now, we all hear those the stories about the uh, legal fees people spend in respect mm -hmm. to uh, thousands, hundred thousand dollars in legal fees to decide what are the rights and obligations. So a marriage agreement is really appealing from that perspective and we see quite an increase in requests for that exactly because of that, because it creates predictability for people. It's no longer a mystery what mm -hmm. may happen and creates the stability. So definitely it's a good idea and uh, it oftentimes helps resolves more problems uh, uh, in the long run, having that conversation. This question may be, may be uh, very facile and it may have a very complicated answer, but say you sign a prenup with someone um, that say in the event of divorce, both of you just keep whatever money and income that you have. Does that uh, remove any obligation to support the spouse if you're the wealthier person uh, after a divorce? Or does the civil law supersede the, any prenup? Well, it's a good question. And uh, I think as many lawyers will say, there are two types of answers to this. Uh, the simple answer is yes, well, that's the agreement and that's what the parties agreed to. But the underlying answer, it gets a bit more complicated. It's a question of how was this agreement negotiated? Was there financial disclosure? Was there predictability in terms of and transparency from the parties? Did anything happen? Is there a power imbalance? Is anything happens with makes this agreement invalid? That's why lots of thought goes into drafting those agreements, both from procedural perspective in terms of having this financial disclosure, having legal advice, making sure that it's negotiated fairly, and also the content of the agreement, that it clearly outlines what the rights obligations are. So the simple answer is yes, they are predictable, but caution must be given in terms of how they're negotiated and how they're drafted. And that's why uh, that really guides those type of disputes when parties disagree about the agreements. Give us an idea, what happens to debt in the event of divorce? That's a very common issue nowadays, considering our economy and the, the if absent as a marriage agreement, uh, that is part of the calculation, what we call equalization and net family property calculation, essentially it reduces once uh, what the assets a person has to divide. So. The unfortunate part is, and it's commonly misconceived, a family law in Ontario does not divide debt. It divides assets or net assets. So for parties who have more debt than their assets, uh, the calculation comes down to zero, not a negative. So that's another part of the issue that often addressed in marriage agreements, that we can address what happens in a negative situation, but absent an agreement, the law will only go to zero, not into a negative. And just finally, some people, of course, are on their second marriages. Can it be particularly important to get a prenup there? Especially I'm thinking about um, offspring of the second, if there's offspring from the second marriage, things can get pretty complex, can't they, with these uh, compound families? 
Second marriages, more children, potentially we see a second marriages happen, what we call in situations of great divorces, that uh, there are older people, there are more assets, there may be liabilities to previous relationships. So definitely another layer of complexity. We, a big portion of uh, clients who we see asking for marriage agreements is exactly uh, second marriage situations. Uh, this is the type of uh, structures we structure over in the agreements. We make sure that uh, uh, there is predictability there. Um, and uh, definitely it's a good idea because uh, the, the amount of complexity and more people involved can cause significant disputes, which can be avoided by the simplicity of such an agreement. So definitely a great idea, absolutely. And the family pet, that can apparently be a bone of contention. Who gets the dog? Uh, should that be covered in a prenup? Definitely, especially in Ontario. Other provinces are starting to consider legislations uh, to address the family pet and how to deal with it. In Ontario, unfortunately, we still deal with family pets as assets as property and no different than a refrigerator or a TV. And the really the question becomes absent an agreement. It's uh, who bought it, who owns it, who is on quote unquote title of that uh, animal, which is uh, obviously an emotional aspect and uh, marriage agreements can definitely address that and uh, resolve that uh, emotional anguish uh, to realize that that uh, your pet will be treated as any other uh, chattel in the house. What, what's the, these provinces you said they're bringing in legislation on that, what's the thrust of the laws that they're uh, introducing? The, the thrust of the law is to introduce a special kind of uh, arrangement to deal with uh, animals uh, and pets, uh, which take into consideration, and I think that's a critical part, for example, the, the potential power imbalance in the family, the use of the animal to have coercive control of the other uh, party. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not as much of a custody like we deal with children, for example. It's more to understand that the animal have specific dynamic and the specific can be used specifically within the separation negatively. And that needs to be addressed in considering the ownership. Yeah, it has to be taken seriously. As you say, it can be a tool to coerce the other partner. And uh, yeah, um, it, I mean, yeah, it's a serious business. Absolutely. And unfortunately, when separations happen, uh, as much as we as lawyers try to prevent them from getting uh, uh, more dirty or difficult, uh, unfortunately, pets can play a very devious role, especially when uh, uh, the owner of the animal is not necessarily who cares most about it. And it can be definitely be used in, in, in negative ways, which uh, uh, it's hopeful that the law adjusts